the subject of this short video clip is justification, and that's addressed by this question. Why is real-time ECM effectiveness assessment, in other words, calculation of the protection bubble size, why is that needed? The answer is because the environment changes and degrades the ECM. Actually, there's several reasons, but this is a very important one. A key concept to understanding this is signal coloration. Signal coloration means that there is less jamming power than you thought, which means that the ECM protection bubble is smaller than you thought. I'll explain this by using some examples from real measurements to show that this is a bona fide phenomenon, and I'll frame it in terms of a signal called a chirp, although the discussion applies equally to reactive and non-reactive jamming. Okay, what is an ECM chirp? We start by drawing a graph where the horizontal axis is frequency and the vertical axis is signal power. This is called a spectrum. And an ECM chirp looks like this. It consists of energy radiated across a particular uh, span of frequencies. In this case, showing one which is flat on top, having equal power at all frequencies. Now here's a measured chirp. Uh, and it's not flat because the transmitter is relatively low, qual low quality. And there's a variation from the low side of the frequency side of the chirp to the high frequency side of the chirp of 11 dB. Now, and that was measured at a range of 13 meters for a particular geometry and test setup. When the chirp was re-measured at 14 meters, we see a change in not only power level, but also its shape. Now, the change in power from low frequency to high frequency across the chirp has become 19 dB, not 11 dB. And when we re-measure the chirp at 15 meters, the only change has been a range, we now see that the variation from low frequency to high frequency has become 5 dB. So over just a very small distance in range, we see a large change in effective radiated power coming from the chirp. We can see chirp coloration effects by using custom software to play back spectra recorded at different ranges for the test conditions represented in the graphs shown previously. So we'll zoom in here. Now this is the spectrum recorded when the distance between the transmit and receive antennas is 5 meters. We can now move to uh, 6 meters. 7 meters. We're seeing an amplitude drop because the receive antenna is moving into a null for the test setup. Now 8 meters. And here we see the first example of significant chirp coloration. The shape of the chirp has changed between 7 and 8 meters. Again, 8 meters. Now we see 7 meters. We're comparing 7, 8, and 7 meters. We call this chirp coloration because the relative energy in each of the spectral components across the top of the chirp has changed. And since frequency is analogous to color, it's like the color of the chirp has changed. At 7 meters, we have kind of a white chirp in that there's equal en energy at all frequencies. And at 8 meters, we have a, a significant loss of energy at higher frequencies. You might say this is a redder chirp. Now, this is concerning because a loss of energy represents a decrease, a loss of jamming power, which represents a decrease in the ECM protection bubble size. So here we are at 8 meters, now 9 meters, 10, 11, 12 meters, 13 meters, 14 meters, and here again, serious chirp coloration, which was shown in the earlier still graphs. Now 15 meters, and the chirp shape is suddenly restored. Now 16 meters, 17, 18, 19, 20 meters, and so on. In this test, as the farther out we move, the amplitude of overall amplitude of the chirp changes, but its shape does not. But there are two instances, at 14 meters and 8 meters, where the chirp shape seriously changes. 16 meters, 15 meters, and here we have 14 meters. And this is concerning. The question is why? The answer is, is due to the environment. Okay, let's have an explanation. Here's a graph. The vertical axis is signal power, and the horizontal axis is distance. Let's put a transmitter at one point and a receiver at another point. Now, there is a direct path and an indirect path or a ground reflection between the two, the transmitter and the receiver. And this results in a certain graph of power versus range between the two uh, signal, or the transmitter and the receiver, characterized by peaks and nulls uh, along, the along the path. Now, if we raise the transmitter heights and antenna heights, what happens is the pattern of power versus range changes. These peaks and nulls get closer and closer together. Now, this can happen due to road curvature. However, or if you lay the geometry on the side, you get this. We can get this where we have a low grazing angle in the forward direction, but if we have a 
a bright scatterer off axis, the grazing angles comes, can become quite high. So we get the same pattern or similar pattern of closely spaced peaks and nulls, such as if we had a natural object or a house or a building or perhaps another vehicle. Now, how does this explain chirp coloration? Here are the ABCs. Here's a chirp, a chirp which can be used potentially to jam radio controlled IEDs. And it consists of a different frequencies across the top here. And at each frequency, we have a different wavelength. So at low frequency, we have a long wavelength. And at high frequency here, we would have a shorter wavelength. OK, back to our graph. Now consider a chirp that looks like this. And consider the low end of the frequency end of the chirp. There is a direct path consisting of a certain number of wavelengths and an indirect path with two legs out to the reflecting off-axis vehicle, say, and back to the receiver. Now at higher frequency, we have uh, the same thing happening, but there are a different number of wavelengths in the forward path, and there are a different number of wavelengths along this two-leg reflected path as well. And because there's a different number of wavelengths, we get a different interaction between the direct and indirect signals, so a different pattern and mount of cancellation or reinforcement, which means that the chirp can change, potentially change shape radically even, like this, notice the loss of jammer power here, just by changing frequencies, compared to the 900 megahertz case. Okay, this is something, the same thing as your protection range shrinking for as long as these conditions exist. Okay, how long is that? Well, since we aren't monitoring it, there is no way to know. Now consider a graph here of a uh, made-up uh, ECM chirp. Let's say we measure something like this in the lab, and of course we, want to, we don't know where the thread is, so we distribute energy equally across the span where the thread is likely to show up. It is possible, because of this off-axis scattering effect, that the chirp spectrum in theater, when it's actually being operated in, a, for example, an urban environment, a scattering environment, might look like this, where the chirp is no longer flat, in fact, there are large gaps in power caused by the presence of off-axis scatterers. Now here's a still from a traffic camera. If we zoom in a little bit, uh, there's a little convoy here. And suppose that there is an ECM uh, antenna here, jammer providing protection against OCID attack. Now this is unscientific, but just by inspection, we can see a number of possible, or just by rays, possible scatterers challenge is to make sure that the ECM, the spacing of the convoy, the location of the convoy relative to the off-axis scatterers and so forth, mitigates the, lo the loss, of potential loss, of ECM coverage. Because if we don't, we can have this.